Until recent years, the study of living things has been all about breaking down the components of life into smaller and smaller parts, studying those parts, and using the knowledge gained to invent medicines and industrial processes. This scientific method has a name, reductionism, and it has shaped the modern world. But to really understand life, wouldn't it be great to see the bigger picture? The bigger picture is what life scientists are now aiming for. To understand how life works, the traditional approach might get us 80% there to, let's say, what we aspire to is some point on the horizon that says, now you have it, you understand how life works. The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. In 1953, a scientific revolution was sparked by James Watson and Francis Crick's discovery of the structure of DNA. In the years that followed, biologists developed the intellectual and technological tools to begin deciphering that code. In labs all over the world, the tools got better and faster, insights into cell biology got deeper, and the promise of cures for various diseases looked feasible. A half century after Watson and Crick's discovery came the Human Genome Project. It was a milestone, not only in the study of living things, but in the development of technologies that made it possible. Vast amounts of genetic data are now produced worldwide. We have not put an end to disease, and we still can't answer the really big questions, like what exactly is life? But scientists at the cutting edge say the bigger picture is within closer reach than ever. To get there, we need nothing short of a paradigm shift in how the science of life is practiced. We need to look at biology as an informational science, and we need to collaborate across disciplines. This new way of doing things is called systems biology. If we really want, want to understand life itself, traditional reductionism is not going to get us all the way there. We need to take a more holistic approach that takes systems-based principles and emergent properties into account. Biological systems comprise two types of digital information. DNA genes through the intermediary of RNA encode functional proteins. Regulatory networks specify how the genes are expressed in space and time. The unpredictable outcome of this interaction is what scientists call an emergent property. Emergence is probably the key term in systems biology. For example, we can determine all the genes that are present in an apple, all the sequences that make an apple an apple. We, we can determine those now. We, will, we can know them, or any organism for that matter. But by knowing those genes, that does not allow us, that we'll, there's no biologists in the world who could look at those genes and then come up with the shape or even maybe the color of an apple. Uh, you could see that the, all those genes are there, but you can't determine the shape. So this shape is an emergent property of how all those genes express themselves in the apple, in the apple tree, in the fruit itself. Uh, it really is the emergent property that is life. In the last decade, we can now get complete parts lists for cells, for organisms, where we couldn't get in the past by studying their genes, by studying their proteins, by studying their RNAs and other components of the cells. We now have the technology that we can do that. The term biologists are using to describe those parts lists is called the omics hierarchy. It started with genomics, which is concerned with the genome, the whole set of DNA encoded genes in a biological system. Transcriptomics studies the level of gene expression, the transcriptome, the set of all RNA transcripts in a system. Proteomics is all about the proteome, the whole set of proteins produced in a system. These and many other omic disciplines interact as a network that they call the interactome. Interactomics, which is, in my opinion, where the rubber meets the road in terms of of systems biology, and this is really where we're at the cutting edge right now. Interactomics is just what it means. How do all those macromolecules, genes, proteins, RNAs, interact in a cell? And remember, the interaction gives you the emergent property, which is life in this case. 
Systems biologists hope by integrating all of these omic disciplines, they will understand biological systems. Technologies such as high-throughput DNA sequencing, microarrays for DNA genotyping, mass spectrometry for proteomic analysis, and sophisticated computational modeling tools are making it all possible. And it could have a profound impact on the future of medicine. But the fact is, when we began to, from a technology point of view, do high-throughput sequencing, everything changed. When you look at uh, the way that medicine is going to be impacted by this emerging science of systems biology, uh, it's a thrilling idea. Uh, we are at a very early, you might even say embryonic, stage in this way of treating patients. I think we're going to need to teach medical students in a, in a different way than we do it now because the way we do diagnosis and treatment is going to be fundamentally different. Systems-based approaches could lead to a form of personalized medicine. Cancer patients would receive treatment based on their individual genome. Doctors would be able to use interactomics to look at an entire system in an individual, such as the respiratory or cardiovascular system, and design the best treatment for that person. Uh, so it will be a science of systems. In the case of the biologist, we can call it systems biology. In the case of medicine, we can call it systems medicine. And in the case of the way we teach it and the way it happens in the private sector, what that translates into is a biologist sitting next to an engineer, sitting next to a physician, sitting next to an ethicist, sitting next to an information theoretician or computer scientist, sitting next to a statistician. 